We're done with the hard stuff. All right. The talk before is uh, is not much fun to give, although in a certain sense it is, just because I like giving it to the enemy, if, if you can put it that way. Um, but now we get to the fun stuff. So what we've done so far, so we've tried to just back up real quick. We're trying to um, ask the Lord to speak into uh, our minds and our hearts the story with the, the desire that we would be either overwhelmed again or perhaps overwhelmed for the first time by what it is that God has done for us. So we've, we've tried to suggest that the gospel's four parts, uh, the goodness of creation, sin, its consequences, God's response to our sin, and then our response to what God has done. I break that down or I reduce it to four words, created, captured, rescued, and response. We looked at created and captured. We're gonna look now. Uh, we're gonna try to combine these two into one, uh, a rescued and a response. And as you can tell from the candles lit at the altar and the monstrance on the altar, this is gonna try to lead us directly into prayer because that's what this is all about. Is not just to get information, but hopefully to experience transformation. And whether this is all new to you or whether this is something that you could teach yourself, um, we're always in need of transformation, at least I know I am. So um, we're, we, we're gonna, I think the schedule might say that there's two talks with a break in between. There is only one talk, it's just longer. And it's gonna go right into a time of adoration. Uh, and then it will close, our time together will close with benediction. Okay, so just to give you an idea of where we're going as we begin. So we're going to look at rescued, which I might subtitle God's shocking and unexpected response to sin. The grace to pray for is unshakable confidence in God. What I'm going to pray in a particular way for is that the Father will enable us by the power of His Spirit to see His Son in a new way. So let's pray and then I want to share with you uh, an image which has been helpful for me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Father, your Son Jesus said that when I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. So I ask right now for the grace of your spirit to be upon me that I might lift up your son in his kindness and his power and his love. That I'd simply be an instrument in his hands so that everybody here might be drawn to him and through him to you who are our Father. Lord, I pray for confidence to be poured into all of us, unshakable confidence that comes from knowing that your Son is Lord, and that the world and the church and our lives and all those that we love are firmly in His hands. Continue, I pray, to dispel and shatter any anxiety, any fear, any discouragement, any worry. Expose and dissipate whatever strategies the enemy is trying to weave in our minds or hearts, even now. Help us to see Jesus in a new way. We ask it all through Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So here's, here's the image. So especially for men, I, uh, maybe, maybe I just want to speak to my brothers in a particular way if I can right now, and especially for younger men. I think oftentimes younger men have an image of Jesus that goes something like this. He's kind. And he's gentle. And he's patient. And he's compassionate. And he's merciful. And he's all those things. Don't get me wrong. I mean, blessed be God or I'd be toast, right? Um, but he's not just gentle and kind and patient and merciful. Jesus is absolutely and utterly unconquerable. And he's the one who's calling you and me to respond to him. 
And he's the one who is inviting you and me to be cooperators with him in accomplishing his father's desire, which is to get his world back. I hate being on the losing side. Like I'm as competitive as anybody that I know, uh, embarrassingly so. Jesus is the winning side, and it's not even close. So we want to ask the Father to help us to see this. The book of Isaiah, God says through the prophet this. Go back to where we ended, right? Back to that image of the person who's been trafficked, or Jesus' parable, the beginning of which starts with, when a strong man guards his possessions, or guards his house, his possessions are safe. This is what God promises in the Old Testament. Can the prey be taken from the mighty? Or the captives of a tyrant be rescued? Who's the prey and the captives? That's us, our race. Who's the mighty and the tyrant? That's the enemy, right? Remember, the enemy is not the other political party. It's not the enemy. The enemy is the enemy. Surely, thus says the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken, and the prey of the tyrant shall be rescued. For I will contend with those who contend with you. Then all flesh shall know that I am the Lord, your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. That, people, is a promise. I, God says, will contend with those who contend with you. I will fight, God promises, for you. Why? So that you will be rescued. We say words in the church often without really knowing what they mean. We say salvation or grace. We say Lord. We'll look at that in a little while. We also say the word redeemer. Does anybody know what the Hebrew word for redeemer is? To make us new? No, but it's an awesome guess. It's that word. Goel. More literally, we would say, all flesh shall know that I am the Lord, your Savior, and your Goel, the mighty one of Jacob. What's the big deal about a Goel? So in in Israel, amongst the people of Israel, there was an obligation that fell to the oldest man in a family to do something if one of two things happened. If either one of his kinsmen or kinswomen was kidnapped, or murdered. The oldest sibling was known as the Goel. And his responsibility was to either buy back the person who had been kidnapped to rescue them or to avenge the murder. God promises that I will make myself to be your nearest kinsman. I will take that responsibility upon myself. I will rescue you from slavery, and I will avenge your death, the death of our race. That's his promise. That's who God sees in you and in me. I don't know why. Like, I ain't ain't all that. Neither are you. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) And yet God looks at us and sees in us Not just people upon whom he takes pity. He makes himself to be, that's my sister. I will fight for you. Not by sending an angel to go do something, but by myself contending with those who contend with you. This creature that we spent so much time looking at. This is probably a familiar icon for many of us. This is uh, one of the more famous icons in the world. It's painted or written by a a Russian iconographer. It's an image of the Holy Trinity. It's it's usually understood to be, rightfully so, uh, a a depiction of the three visitors who come to Abraham. 
and promise Abraham and his wife, or Abram and Sarai at the time, that they're going to uh, give birth. Years ago, I don't even know where I found this anymore. I can't find it. I found it once. I don't think it was a dream. I read a, a, a description of this icon, which I've never forgotten. And the description goes like this. This is a, a scene, if you will, capturing a conversation taking place within the Trinity after the rebellion of Adam. So the figure on the left is the Father. The figure in the center is the Son. And the figure on the right is the Holy Spirit. And the description goes like this. The Father poses the question, who will go and get him? The him is Adam, or you, or me. Who will bring him back? Who will bring him home? And the son is the one in the center, and he has his head turned towards the right, looking at the father, as if to say to the father, I will. I will go and get him. I will bring her back. I'll bring him home. And the Spirit has his head down because the Spirit knows the cost the Son will pay to do that. With that, let's look at these things as we talk about what it is the Son has done to bring us home. I want to look quickly at the Incarnation the passion, and the results of the Paschal mystery. We're obviously going to do this quickly. We can't possibly, this is a semester, right, on each one of these things. So first, the incarnation. Let's go back to D-Day, right? So why are they there? They're there to fight. It's a no-brainer, right? Why is he there? He's there to fight. Scripture tells us the reason, the reason, the Son of God appeared, 1 John 3, 8, was to destroy the works of the devil. It doesn't get much simpler than that. Jesus, shortly before he enters into his passion, now is the judgment of this world. And now shall the ruler of this world, which is the description that we said Jesus uses for the enemy, now shall he be cast out. First miracle in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John, of course, is the wedding feast at Cana. Looking forward to 180 gallons of wine later tonight. Or a smaller percentage of it, maybe. But the first miracle in Matthew, Mark, and Luke is the driving out of a demon. And the very first thing that the demon says to Jesus is, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Have you come here to destroy us? Jesus doesn't answer that question out loud, but the answer, by all means, is an emphatic, yes, I have. That's why I've come. Please don't ever lose sight of that. He hasn't come to just teach us to be kind. He's come to go to war. Those of us who are ordained and those of us who uh, join, those of us ordained, pray the, the Benedictus every morning, this uh, great uh, prayer of uh, John the Baptist's father, where we say over and over again something all having to do with this theme. He has come to his people and set them free. Free from what? Free from the power of death. Free from the power of sin. Free from the tyranny of Satan. He promised that he would save us from our enemies. Who are our enemies? Death, Satan, hell. From the hands of all who hate us. Who hates us? Not the other race. Not the other class. Not the other country. The enemy. And to shine on those who dwell in darkness in the shadow of death. Who's that? That's our race. We live in the shadow of death. And to guide our feet into the way of peace. We looked at this beginning of this parable, which Jesus tells at the end of the captured section. Let's look at the rest of it, right? So Jesus drives out a demon. And after he drives out a, a demon, the Pharisees accuse him of driving out the demon by demons. 
And Jesus tells this parable. It's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's worded a little different in each one of them. He says, when a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. But when one stronger than he assails him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. I can't repeat this often enough. Jesus is stronger than the enemy. Immeasurably so. Infinitely so. Satan cowers in fear at the name of Jesus. The enemy is the strong man. Jesus is the one who is stronger than him. What's he come to do? To bind him. Why? So that we can go free. In Matthew's account of that, Jesus asks, how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? That's what Jesus has come to do. I know we don't talk about this often in the church. But again, the goal of all this is to see biblically. It's to see with the lens that is Scripture. And this is how Jesus talks about what he's come to do. Then indeed, the Lord says, he may plunder his house. So they're there, and he's there to fight. Oftentimes, uh, not oftentimes, always, um, in the octave between Christmas and the Feast of Our Lady, one of the antiphons, unfortunately it's buried as an entrance antiphon at the beginning of Mass, on a weekday during the octave, and most people never hear it, but it's one of the most powerful images of what it is that Jesus has come to do. Book of Wisdom says, When peaceful silence lay over all, and night had run the half of her swift course, down from the heavens, from the royal throne, leapt your all-powerful word, like a pitiless warrior into the heart of a land doomed to destruction. In the Book of Wisdom, that's referring to the Exodus event, but it's a foreshadowing, right? It's a prophecy of what it is that's going to happen in the Incarnation. When peaceful silence lay over all, and night, that is the night of the fall, brought on by the rebellion of Adam and Eve, had run half of her swift course down from the heavens, from the royal throne leapt your all-powerful word, In the Old Testament, that looked like poetry. At the moment of the Annunciation, when Mary said yes, poetry became reality. For real, the all-powerful word, the one through whom the universe that's 46 billion light years across leapt down from his throne and began to dwell in the womb of a creature he had made. Why? To rescue a land doomed to destruction. So the incarnation, God becoming man in the person of Jesus, is the invasion of one kingdom by a stronger kingdom. Just like D-Day is the invasion of the allies against the Nazi empire in Europe. There's a a great scholar, he's actually now he goes by the name of Brother Simeon, I believe it is, uh, who has a great lay name of Erasmo Leva Maricacus. It's a mouthful, I know. He's a Greek Cuban, and he has this uh, three-volume commentary on the Gospel of Matthew, each of which is about 600 pages long, and they're phenomenal. And in one of the commentaries, he says this, Christ did not come merely to teach a new doctrine about how we should behave or to set an example of selflessness. Christ came, above all, to perform a deed, the destruction of death and the establishment of an everlasting kingdom of life. C.S. Lewis, in Mere Christianity, puts it this way, enemy-occupied territory. That's what this world is, right, as a result of the fall. Christianity is the story of how the rightful king has landed, you might say, landed in disguise. 
Why? Because he's trying to provoke a fight. So the enemy isn't wise. Wisdom is a virtue. He has no virtue. But he isn't stupid. The enemy knows he can't defeat God. God comes to engage the enemy in a battle in disguise so as to provoke a fight. And why? (laughs) For you and for me. That's why this is happening. If this is me, if I'm the creator of the universe, and if you're the creator of the universe, and your creature rebels against you, you just do this and start all over again, right? Like, nuts to them. Stupid people. I'll make them new people. God didn't do that with you and me. There's a a book that came out about two years ago. Anybody ever read this book? Or familiar with this book? I knew you were. Um, I, I, I measure my life oftentimes by when I met certain authors or when I read certain books. This is a, a life-changing book for me. So I think I got it because Bishop Barron spoke about it in something that I read maybe two and a half years ago. So I saw the title, I'm, I'm Drawn to the Passion of Jesus. It's like the crucifix is the earliest memory of my life that I can remember. So I've always had a, a focus in my own prayer on uh, the Lord's Passion. Saw this, I said, I, w- I want to read that. Looks great. I ordered it. Uh, It's like, I don't know, 800 pages, right? You're still reading. You're about halfway through, yeah. It's taking you a year. So um, I don't know if it's available on tape or not. It'll take you like the equivalent of counting to a quadrillion probably to listen to. But (laughs) So anyway, I'm reading this book. It came. It was this big. I went, okay, that's going to be good for Lent. Started reading it on Ash Wednesday, and like four paragraphs into it, I'm like, this is amazing. Who is this guy? Well, it's not a guy. Um, Fleming Rutledge is a uh, 80-some-year-old uh, retired Anglican woman priest. So just like full disclosure, uh, if, to give you a glimpse of me, so if you had told me 30 years ago that one of my favorite books of all time was going to be written by a woman Anglican priest, I would have said you're out of your mind. Um, I've never read anybody like her. Um, She's become a a real sister in the Lord to me and a great influence on on us. Uh, We're trying to actually go out to see her in New York in uh, April. And uh, there's obviously some things she would say that uh, she doesn't agree with me on, and I'd say the same about her, but I've never never encountered a more manly preacher in my life than this woman. (laughs) She is absolutely exceptional. This book is, uh, is a game changer. Um, She has a book called The Undoing of Death, which I can't encourage you to read enough. Uh, It's a collection of her sermons on um, Holy Week and Easter and Easter Week. Uh, I I would highly recommend anything that she wrote. Anyway, I I read this book two lengths ago, and it it, uh, it became the the impetus, really, for me to begin to just ask the Lord, Lord, i got to find a way to tell the story in a way that's going to overwhelm people because I'm getting overwhelmed by this. So one of the things that comes out of this, and maybe you can find a, what would I find the biggest crucifix in this church? There's one above the tabernacle. So maybe you can see the Lord hanging on the screen back there. So that's an image from the the movie, The Passion. I want to just focus in on this for a little while. So Jesus says, before he enters into his passion, that the ruler of this world is coming but he has no power over me. We just want to continue to remember that. huh? I have the power, Jesus says, to lay down my life, and I have the power to take it up again. No one, he says, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord, and I will take it up of my own accord. Who's he going to lay it down for? You and me. Why? so as to rescue us. So when you look at Jesus on a cross, so just look at that image from the the movie, The Passion of the Christ. Ask yourself, is Jesus the hunted or the hunter? Hmm. 
Is he a victim? Or is he the aggressor? That would seem to be a no-brainer, right? Here's a man. Jesus has a human nature. He's stark naked. Forget the images of Jesus on a crucifix with a loincloth on. Jesus has no clothes on on the cross. That's the whole point of crucifixion. It's utmost humiliation. The point of crucifixion is degradation. It didn't happen in a dungeon somewhere where nobody saw it. It happened on the corner of I-29 and 635 so that everybody would see it. It's very public. It's ritual humiliation. And part of the game is people are invited so as to mock you. So here's a man, stark naked, crowned with thorns, nailed to a tree. But remember who this is. Right? Who's Jesus? Jesus is the one through whom a universe, 46 billion light years across, was created. All things came into existence through him and for him. How do you nail that God to a cross? You can't. Where do you get that nail? There's only one way God can get on a cross. Only one. He has to want to be there. Why in the world would God want to be on a cross? So theologically, it's correct to say that Jesus is the victim, right? But understand what we mean by that. What we don't mean is that he's the passive recipient of this. Jesus is actually picking the fight. I'll share with you how it is that I feel like the Lord taught me this. And then I'll tell you that this is not just my wacky, which is true, imagination. It gets backed up by the fathers of the church. About two years ago, it's just before Holy Week, so two years ago, this coming Easter, I'm about to celebrate Mass for our kids in the school. I'm sitting in my chapel in the house where I lived. I'm praying over the scriptures for the day. And out of nowhere, I hear the Lord say these words to me. Why do I know it's the Lord? Because uh, like, I know how the Lord talks to me. Sometimes it's just the fact that I had too much pizza the night before, but sometimes it's obviously the Lord talking to me. There's ways to discern that without getting into that. I'm sitting in the chapel, and out of nowhere, I hear ambush predator. I'm like, ambush predator? What the heck's an ambush predator? I have my phone next to me, which I probably shouldn't when I'm in the chapel. I Google ambush predator, and I just start to laugh. Like, you've got to be kidding me. So an ambush predator is a creature which lies motionless and still, camouflaged with its environment. That's an ambush predator. That's an ambush predator. These things are everywhere, right? They're in the woods. They're in your house. <laughs> Might be in your bed. <laughs> Thanks, Father. This is really helping me sleep. They're in the ocean. They're everywhere, right? Why do they do it? For one purpose. To attract prey. That's why they lay motionless, just to attract prey. And when the prey comes, they just pounce. From the moment of the agony in the garden, Jesus is camouflaging his divinity more and more and more. There's only been one time, right, when his divinity has burst forth from him. That's the transfiguration. And that's just a fleeting glimpse shining through him, right? And only Peter, James, and John see it. But from the moment of the Garden of Gethsemane, everything is getting cloaked in a profound way, right? Look what happens, right? Jesus in the Garden sweats blood, which is a real physiological effect in a person's body. He's arrested. He's chained. He's slot. This is the son of God we're talking about. Remember how big the universe is? 70 sextillion stars, right? That's, this is the one who made them. He's slapped. <laughs> Judged by some clown named Pilate. Stripped naked. Scourged. 
crowned with thorns, nailed to a cross. Why? That's why. Just like those other creatures that we see, he's trying to entice the enemy or the prey to come close to him. Jesus on the cross, I would argue, is the ambush predator. Like nobody else and nothing else. Here's how one person writes, might even be Fleming again. Jesus shared our flesh and blood, our vulnerable material existence, full of suffering and pain, so that through death, the power of death would be destroyed. The only way to conquer death was to engage death on its own territory, mano a mano. The gospel message in Paul and in Hebrews is that our Lord destroyed the power of death through or by death. How are we to understand that? The ordinary way of thinking about destroying an enemy is with his own weapons. It's to use his own weapons against him. Jesus Christ did something entirely different. Christ defeated death by death, but here's the key. He did not use the weapons of death. He suffered death in order to conquer death. He underwent death in order to overcome death. He submitted to death to subdue death. But he fought death not by duplicating its methods, but by entering its realm, entering it with no defenses, whatever, except trust in the ultimate purpose of God the Father. There's always been three ways to understand the passion. What's happening when Jesus is undergoing his passion? We typically talk about two of them. All three of these are necessary to keep in mind to get a a comprehensive understanding of what it is that's going on when Jesus goes to the cross. The cross, for many people, it sounds silly to say it this way, but this is how we often act, or so it seems. It's just this like really unfortunate, tragic ending to what was a great life, and then like magically comes the resurrection, and then we're back on with it, but we don't know what to do with the passion. Jesus is never not in control. Nothing's ever happening to him. Frank Sheed, one of the great... Christian apologists, Catholic apologists of the 50s, 60s, and 70s used to remind us the most active moment of Jesus' priesthood is when he's hanging on a cross. Because the only way for him to be on the cross is to will it. This is, this is from which you get the idea of redemptive suffering. Everybody's going to suffer in this life. Many of us already have greatly. When it comes, I can do one of two things with it. I can either waste it, which is what I usually do, and complain, or I can unite it to his cross for the sake of others. That's really important when you begin to suffer or when someone you love suffers. St. Paul says, I fill up in my own flesh what's lacking in the sufferings of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church, which means what? Nothing's lacking in the sufferings of Christ except my participation in it. This is why John Paul spoke so often about the redemptive nature of suffering. It's why John Paul wanted to be photographed as often as he was when he couldn't speak his words clearly anymore, he couldn't stand up straight, and he was drooling. He wanted to give people who were sick and growing older dignity. He wanted to remind them, you still have great worth. Don't look back to what was back there. Understand you're now entering into moments which might be more fruitful than any moment of your life because now you're sharing in our Lord's passion. The three ways to understand the passion are these. First, Jesus on the cross is showing us the love of the Father. It's that guy behind home plate at every baseball game, right? John 3.16. You know what John 3.16 is? God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son so that we would not perish but have eternal life. So to see Jesus on the cross is to see how much the Father loves us, how much, you're, how much you matter, right? Is that true? Absolutely. It's not complete, though. It's not enough. 
It moves many people in here. It doesn't move some of us. But it's true. It's just not exhaustively true. The second way to understand the passion is that Jesus on the cross is becoming sin. He's making atonement for us. St. Paul writes that God made him who knew no sin to be sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In other words, Jesus on the cross is absorbing into himself all of the sins ever committed by the entire human race. Is that true? Absolutely. Does that move many people? I don't think so. Most of us look at the cross and go, mm, I don't think I'm that bad a guy. The reality is I am, and so are you. Like, I need that. Somebody said once after the Passion of the Christ came out, if that's the remedy, what's the wound? But that's not complete by itself. The third way to understand the Passion, and the preferred way of most of the fathers of the early church, which is to say most of those men who were the immediate successors of the apostles and then up until the 6th, 7th, 8th century. The way they spoke about Jesus in his passion was Jesus is going to war to rescue us. How many people here have seen the passion of the Christ? Anybody recognize that image? There's a really weird scene in the movie right after Jesus breathes his last, where a, a drop of water, which is, I imagine, supposed to be symbolic of the Father's tears, falling from the sky, lands on the ground, explodes, and then you see this image for like a half a second. It's Satan on this cracked piece of earth, and he's screaming. You know why? Because he just realized that he undid himself. So you have to picture that the Lord on the... This is, you got to think imagery here because it's the only way you can try to understand these mysteries which are so far beyond just our intellect. It's as if the Lord on the cross is hanging there and he wants to be swallowed by death because he wants to destroy it from inside. Augustine used to say, together with a number of the other fathers of the church, it's only right that the one who deceived our race at the beginning of our history should himself be deceived and bring about his own destruction. That's what that's telling us. Here's one of the most powerful ways I know to talk about it. This is an excerpt from a sermon given by um, St. Ephraim the Syrian back in the 5th century. He says, death trampled our Lord underfoot. But he, in his turn, treated death as a high road for his own feet. He submitted to it, enduring it willingly, because by this means he would be able to destroy death in spite of itself. Death had its own way when our Lord went out from Jerusalem carrying his cross. But when, by a loud cry from that cross, he summoned the dead from the underworld, death was powerless to prevent it. Death slew him by means of the body which he had assumed, but that same body proved to be the weapon with which he conquered death. Concealed beneath the cloak of his manhood, his Godhead engaged death in combat, but in slaying our Lord, death itself was slain. It was able to kill natural human life, but was itself killed by the life that is above the nature of man. Death could not devour our Lord unless he possessed a body, and neither could hell swallow him up unless he bore our flesh. And so get a load of this line. And so he came in search of a chariot in which to ride to the underworld. This chariot was the body which he received from the virgin. In it, he invaded death's fortress, broke open its strong room, and scattered all its treasure. That people is not gentle Jesus, meek and mild. That's the real Jesus, or the complete 
Jesus. Jesus on the cross, right, says these words, it is finished. This is not like him hanging on the cross going, finally, that's done. The word that he uses there, huh? the word that we use in the Gospel of John, can be translated in all these different ways. It is accomplished. It's fulfilled. It's carried out. It's performed. It's achieved. It's completed. A friend of mine used to write these dramatic monologues of uh, different men and women in Scripture, and they were just telling narratives of, like, say, Peter encountering Jesus for the first time, and miraculous catch of fish and being called to follow him. One of the monologues he wrote, which was really powerful, was a a depiction of the archangel Michael's, fitting for this place, um, understanding of the crucifixion. So it was Michael describing for us, the way this man wrote it, what it was like to be there that day. And so he wrote in such a way, it was, again, this is just his own imagination, but it's rooted in scripture, right? But going to this verse, so he's writing as if to say, so the moment of the crucifixion, so there's Jesus on the cross, and he describes, this is Michael talking, you know, all the crowds around him, the Pharisees and the high priests and uh, all the soldiers and all the other people who are there, and the demons are there, and Michael's describing the demons behind the people who are tempting the crowds to mock Jesus and to taunt Jesus and to hurt him in all the different ways that they were trying to. And then he describes at a certain point, it's as if the demons themselves begin to shake and to shudder. And the sky grows darker and darker. And then soon, standing right in front of Jesus is Satan. And Satan begins to mock Jesus. And the Lord has his head down this whole time. And Satan just begins to assail him. You utter failure. You fool, you stupid man. All those things that you set out to do, nothing will come from them now. He shows him history after the Lord's death, Auschwitz, Pol Pot, abortion, human trafficking. And the Lord looks at him, or the Lord doesn't yet look at him. Satan begins to say to him, you know, don't you? In just a few moments, you're mine. Because no one escapes death. And you might have done miracles, but I've seen miracles. And you might not sin, but that woman over there, she didn't sin either. But you're mine. And in this narrative, my friend wrote it, it was at this point that Jesus raises his head and stares right at Satan and says those words. It is finished. So what comes of all this? What's the good news about what Jesus has accomplished for us in his death and resurrection? So I want to look at these with us quickly. He has done all of these things. He has destroyed death, transferred us, recreated us, divinized us, rendered sin impotent, humiliated the enemy, given us authority over the enemy, and sent us on mission to get his world back. I just want to walk through these quickly. So the first result of the passion and his resurrection is he has destroyed death. So I I told you I lost my dad, my mom, my brother. I've lost countless friends. I've buried thousands of people at this point in my life. Why is it that we can grieve with hope? Because death can't hold me anymore. That's why. I'm going to die. I watched three of the people I love the most in this world die. But I don't grieve them without hope. Why? Because Jesus has destroyed death. Its power can't hold us anymore. He seizes us back after death grabs us. That's the result of his passion and his his resurrection, huh? The prophecy in Isaiah 25, he will destroy on this mountain, this is God, the covering that is cast over all peoples and the veil that is spread over all the nations. 
God will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. There's a lot of us in here who have cried a lot of tears over people that we've lost. God promises you will feel his finger on your cheek wiping away your tears and mine. And the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, lo, like lo, get a load of God. This is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Paul to Timothy says, Our Savior Christ Jesus abolished death. Like, you know, you elect somebody into office, they abolish things. God abolished death. And brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Jesus says to John in the beginning of Revelation, Fear not, I am the first and the last, and the living one. Once I died, but behold, I'm alive forever, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. Who do you know who can say something like that? Well, you know, once I was dead, um, but I'm alive now. You don't know anybody who can say that, except God. Hebrews. Since, therefore, the children share in flesh and blood, he, Jesus, himself likewise partook of the same nature, that through death he might destroy him who has the power of death, that is, the devil. And the next line goes on to say, and deliver those who their whole lives long had been held bound by the fear of death. Don't raise your hand, just ask yourself seriously right now, are you afraid of dying? Because the Christian isn't supposed to be. I'm afraid of how I'm going to (laughs) die. Like, like really? (laughs) But I'm not afraid of death. Why? Because it can't hold me. Why? Because Jesus has crushed it. He's robbed it of its power. Paul to Corinthians, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and every power for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Like imagine what it's like to live without fearing losing loved ones let alone losing your own life. That's why Paul can mock death. And taunt it. Oh, death, where's your victory? Oh, death, where's your sting? You don't have one anymore, right? But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the first result of the Paschal Mystery. Second result, he's transferred us. Remember, we looked at this passage earlier, Colossians 1, 13 to 14. This is the passage I read every time I baptize a child. Because that's when this happens. When a child or an adult gets baptized, they're transferred. He has delivered us, rescued us from the dominion or the lordship or the rule or the government of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We hand children or their godparents and their parents, you know, these little baptismal certificates like, here, isn't this cute? You know, do something with this. The reality is behind that little certificate is an amazing thing. Your, your old birth certificate, which said, king, you know, child of the kingdom of darkness, that's now null and void. Now you're a child of the kingdom of light. A friend of mine, a Baptist minister, he used to teach people, I thought this was the most powerful image I've ever heard of what happens in baptism. He says, imagine, and this won't take a lot of imagining for some of us, imagine growing up in a dysfunctional house. Parents who fight. Alcoholic father, abusive mom. There's verbal abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse. Plates fly, quite literally. You hate it there. You do everything you can to not be home, right? You get involved in every sport, every extracurricular activity, everything you can. Sneak in late at night because you hate waking up people because if you wake up people, you might feel their wrath or their hand. Across the street lives this annoyingly happy family. 
And you hear them all the time out your bedroom window. The father playing with his kids, laughing, having fun, playing catch, while you live in this horrible place. And then one day, while you're the only person at home, you hear a knock on the door. And you go downstairs, answer the door, and it's the dad from across the street. And he says, do you want to come live with us? And you don't even pack. That's baptism. You move from the house of a tyrant to the house of a good father. Scott Hahn, in his commentary on this, the recipient of baptism undergoes a death to the bondage of sin and is brought to life again by a reception of grace. Fleming again, it takes hard mental work to enter Paul's thought world and to understand that his words do not describe a bondage to a harsh puritanical code imposed upon us by a tyrannical outside force. That's what most young people, and many older people for that matter's image of Christianity is. It's a bunch of rules that restrict me. No, that's the enemy. The enemy has the harsh puritanical code. Paul means the opposite. The gospel of Christ means precisely deliverance from tyrannical outside forces into a realm of light and of life. Third fruit of the Paschal mystery, Jesus has recreated us. This is the theme of St. Paul, right? If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. We say to people all the time or about people all the time, well, you know, that's Scott. That's just the way he is. He's always going to be that way. No, it's not true. The whole premise of the Christian life is you can change. Like right now, you can change at this moment. You could have walked into this church right now struggling with whatever it is that you've been struggling with for however long you've been struggling. The reality is at this moment, because of the power of the Holy Spirit given to us because of what it is that Jesus has accomplished for us by his death and resurrection, you can change and leave it here so that you can grow in freedom. How do you do that? Not by trying harder. You do that by surrendering. You just say things like, Lord, I can't do this. But you can. So please do. One of the coolest things in the sky is this nebula. So there's a a nebula in the constellation Orion which they call a a star nursery. So there's new stars constantly being created. And the God that creates stars at this moment is able to recreate me right now. Every time I walk out of the confessional, it's what he's doing. He's recreating me as I leave behind whatever it is that I brought in there. What else has he done? This is an annoying one for me, quite candidly, because I don't uh, experience this fully yet. He's rendered sin, capital S, impotent. What does that mean? That means you and I don't have to sin. Sin has no power over me. And it has no power over you. Why? Because Jesus has robbed it of its sting. Before Jesus' death and resurrection, there was no chance for me. I was held bound by the power, the dominion of sin. I'm not anymore. I have living inside of me the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead. That's amazing power. (laughs) Because of that Spirit in me, I don't have to sin. Don't get me wrong. I do all the stinking time. I do because I have memories and habits and instincts, but I don't have to. If I really wanted to, I could be a saint like now. I'm not. Just ask anybody who works with me. But I could be. So could you. Paul writes, we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the sinful body might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For he who has died 
is freed from sin. That's what he means. Monsignor Knox, who was a great Englishman writing at the beginning of the 20th century, he used to try to remind us, don't, don't misunderstand what Paul's saying here. This is not like, cool, I'm just going like, to coast to victory right now. This is not an all clear. Like, that's not what this is at all. This is just an announcement that you actually finally have a chance to win. Right? Before the Paschal Mystery, there was no chance. We, we couldn't win. Right? Now I can struggle and I can win. Before I knew the Lord, there was no struggle. I just like gave in all the time. Now at least there's a struggle. Here's my favorite, personally, result of the passion. Jesus has humiliated the enemy. St. Paul writes in Colossians chapter 2, verse 15, he has disarmed, the Greek there is more literally, he has stripped naked. The principalities and powers, who are those principalities and powers? Sin, death, Satan, and hell. And made a public example of them, or humiliated them, triumphing over them in him. I don't know what you have in your mind when you read those words, but everybody in the first century when Paul wrote those words knew what Paul was talking about. He was talking about one of these. This is a triumph. A triumph is a very particular parade held in an empire filled with parades. There were very precise conditions under which a triumph, which was a technical word, could be held. It meant that the emperor was coming into Rome on his return from battle after having met serious conditions or several conditions, and he would ride into Rome in his chariot, surrounded by part of his army, with all the people that he had just captured from the army that he had defeated, and all the things that he had taken from the country. And so Julius Caesar, after eight years of fighting the king of Gaul, finally at the battle's conclusion, they apprehend the king of Gaul. The defeat is final. His victory is assured. Caesar's all cleaned up. He's seated on his throne. They grab the king of Gaul. They bring him up in front of Caesar. They strip him naked. They push him to his knees. They make him kiss the Roman eagle. As if to say, you lost, and we won. They stand him up. They chain his hands behind his back. They put him in a cage, and they begin to parade back to Rome. This is the beginning of a triumph. And then into Rome comes Caesar, seated on his throne, surrounded by his army, with a long line of people that he's captured. And at the end of this long line is a man in a cage with no clothes on, with his hands chained behind his back, and a sign above his head. And the sign says, this is the one who used to threaten us and make our life miserable. He won't do that anymore. That's what Paul says Jesus has done to Satan. He is leading him in triumph. Because of that, Jesus has given us authority over the enemy. This is huge, people. You're not powerless in this battle that we're fighting right now. Jesus says, I've given you authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. What began at the moment of, the, of Easter was the beginning of the recreation of this universe. It wasn't just God showing off one time, like, hey, look what I could do in your life if I wanted to. It was the beginning of putting everything right. And one day, the king will return, and he will make everything right. In the meantime, you and I are supposed to be instruments in his hands to be agents to make that happen. Whether we work in healthcare, we work in the judicial system, whether we're teachers, whether we're stay-at-home moms or dads, whatever we put our hands to, we're supposed to transform everything in this world that we live in so that it is recreated. One of the ways we do that is we come against the power of the enemy, and we can do that because we have Jesus' authority. C.S. Lewis, I mentioned the beginning of this quote earlier, Here's the whole quote. Enemy occupied territory. That's what this world is. Christianity is the story of how the rightful king is landed. You might say landed in disguise and is calling us all to take part in a great campaign of sabotage. 
I love that line. That's my life's mission. That should be your life's mission as a disciple. I want to blow things up that belong to the enemy. Not literally. I want to undo his power. How do we do that? Speaking truth, speaking love, bringing the gospel, helping to heal people, loosening his grip. Wherever we can do it, that's what God's calling us to be, agents of sabotage. And finally, he sent us on mission to get his world back. Jesus says to Peter in a passage that I don't think many people understand what Jesus is saying, and I tell you, you are Peter. So Peter has just said, you're the Christ, huh? Now Jesus changes Simon's name, calls him Peter, which, oh, by the way, is not a name. It's a thing, right? Peter means rock. It's like me saying, Tim, you know what? Uh, I'm going to call you I'm going to call you dump truck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, great. That's what you're going to be from now on, dump truck. You know, that's what Peter means, you know, like the equivalent, right? I'm going to call you rock. And on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Oftentimes, we hear that passage, and we say something like this. Well, things are getting bad, but I think Jesus promised no matter how bad they get, the church is never going to collapse. That's not what he promised. That's not what he's saying. Anybody ever been attacked by a gate? A gate. No one's ever been attacked by a gate, right? A gate is not an offensive tactic. It's a defensive tactic. You use gates to keep people out. What Jesus is saying is hell has no chance. That's what he's saying. Not against me, against God. So go and undo its kingdom. That's what he's saying. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole of creation. That's the point of trying to share the story with everybody is so that you and I can take this, integrate it, ask the Lord to help us understand it more fully, and then share it with people in a way that they'll be able to say to us, like that woman said to me, that's not the God I knew growing up. I've never heard that before. I'm in. Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, so go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am, I, the one through whom the universe was made, the one who humiliated the enemy, I am with you always to the close of the age, so do not be afraid and do not be anxious. I was giving this uh, talk to some folks over in uh, Rapid City, I think it was a couple months ago, and it was in one of the breaks, and one of the guys came up to me at one of the breaks. He says, Father, I, I think I understand this. What I don't understand is why. Why would God do this? Which in another way of asking is this. What's the heart of the gospel? What is it that you and I are sent to proclaim to people? What is it that God wants to say to you right now in this church? I think he wants to say this. The answer to the why is because love does such things. And God is love, which only tells me I don't know anything about love because I wouldn't do anything like this for anybody. The heart of the gospel are those two words. You matter. Or the way another person put it, to say I love you to somebody is to say that. You are worth the trouble. That's what the one who made the universe, that's 46 billion light years across, who became man, who allowed himself to be stripped naked and nailed to a cross and crowned with thorns, says to you from the cross, you are worth the trouble of me doing this. The proclamation of the gospel is the fact that Jesus is Lord. 
which is an expression which meant something to the first century Christians. It doesn't mean much to us today, I'm afraid. It's just the ending of a prayer. But those are fighting words in the Roman Empire. Because in the Roman Empire, there was a Lord. His name was Caesar. And he had a gospel. And he had evangelists. And he promised peace and security. But he was a fraud. The answer doesn't come from any politician, as important as politics are. Don't get me wrong. The answer comes from God, who is Lord. And because he's Lord, it means, oh, by the way, nobody else is. And because of that, I don't have to be afraid. And because of that, I have unshakable confidence in him. Let me share this with you. This is a, a sermon. I think it's one of the greatest sermons I've ever heard in my life. It was given back in the second century by a guy named Melito of Sardis. I call this the trash-talking Jesus. So this is Melito speaking as if it's, can you imagine giving this homily at the Easter Vigil in here? He's speaking as if this is Jesus talking. Who is he who contends with me? Let him stand in opposition to me. I set the condemned man free. I gave the dead man life. I raised up the one who's been entombed. Who is my opponent? I, he says, am the Christ. I am the one who destroyed death and triumphed over the enemy and trampled Hades underfoot, and bound the strong one. I passed by this billboard five times now since I've been here yesterday of Patrick Mahomes standing there like this with his hands in his collar. It's a great image, right? Don't get me wrong. Sports is an awesome thing, and when you win, it's a tremendous achievement. The honor that we give to athletes is idolatrous. And I love sports. Where is his honor? Jesus conquered death, people. How is it that you can lose your voice at a football game and never open your mouth in a church? How is it you can boldly and proudly wear emblems of whatever sports team you're a fanatic of and be ashamed to open your mouth because you're a disciple of the one through whom the world was made and who routed the power of hell. How is that possible? Where is God's glory and his honor? No man deserves what Jesus deserves. And we cower in fear so often as Christians, afraid to say that we're his disciples. Shame on us. Let all that you do to tell people how proudly you are right now of being from Kansas City with a trophy be an image for you of what you should be for him. A herald of him who has done all that he has. This is, Jesus says, the Alpha and the Omega. This is the beginning and the end. An indescribable beginning. In an incomprehensible end, this, Jesus says, is the Christ. This is the king. This is the general. This is the Lord. This is the one who rose from the dead. This is the one who sits at the right hand of the Father. This is the one before whom every person in this church and every person on the face of the earth is going to have to render an account. This is the face in front of the one who's going to say to us, please God, at the end of our lives, well done, my good and faithful servant. Oh, just wait till you see what I have for you. John Paul used to say all the time when he was alive, I'll say it to you right now, don't ever be ashamed of the gospel. Ever. Don't ever be ashamed to identify yourself as a disciple of the King and as a friend of the Lord, ever. It will cost you, people. It's going to cost us greatly in the years to come. But don't be afraid of that. Remember this promise? Even the captives of the mighty shall be taken, and the prey of the tyrant shall be rescued. For I will contend with those who contend with you. 
and all flesh shall know that I am the Lord, your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. I'm going to ask Deacon John to bring out our Lord right now. And I'm going to keep this image on the screen. This is one of the favorite icons of the Eastern Church. It's an image of Jesus on Easter Sunday coming out of the grave. And he's standing on top of Satan's head, at least he is in some icons. And underneath his feet, you can see chains and keys. Those are all the chains of death and sin. And he has his two hands outstretched. And in one hand is a man, and the other hand is a woman. The man is Adam, and the woman is Eve. And behind those two figures are hundreds and thousands of people as Jesus liberates hell. That Jesus is on the altar, people. Hiding under the appearance of bread, because if he didn't, we would never dare to get close to him. And just like in that image in the icon, his hands are outstretched right now. To you and to me, wherever you are in your life, whatever tomb you might find yourself in, whether it's fear or anxiety or worry. And he's just saying, take my hand and let me pull you out of where you are, for I did not make you to be stuck in this tomb. I made you for life. What is the appropriate response to a God who makes us and then rescues us from all that he has rescued us from at the cost of his life. What is it that Jesus most wants? What he wants is our faith. What's faith? Faith is surrender. is it that we could possibly trust like him? Who's given us any reason to trust like he has? The answer is nobody. I want to invite you, if you're willing, but only if you're willing, to join me in doing what it is that God desires from us, which is to surrender to him right now. So faith isn't just, you know, intellectually believing that there's a God. The demons do that. Faith is saying to the Lord, Lord, here's my life. You can have it. I just want to be whatever you want me to be. And I want to do it all out of gratitude for all that you've done for me. And all that you will yet do. think you can do that, join me as we pray this. God, I believe that out of your infinite love, you have created me. I'm sorry for all the times I have believed the enemy's lies, that you are not a good father and don't love me. Please forgive me for all of my sins. Thank you for sending Jesus, the ambush predator, to rescue me from sin death, hell, and Satan. I choose this day to place your son, Jesus, at the center of my life. So today, here and now, I surrender to you, Jesus, and desire your lordship over every area of my life. I ask you now to flood my soul with the gift of the Holy Spirit. Help me to know my true identity as a beloved son, Help me to know that I matter and I am worth dying for. Recreate me to be the person you destined me to be. 
Please use me as an instrument in your merciful hands to rescue others and to help recreate this world that you so love. Amen. I just want to invite us as we uh, look back on those things that the Lord might want to bring to mind uh, from the course of the day, those things that made an impression on us, those things that either he said directly or that we heard indirectly, however it came, uh, to go back and linger over them as we look at the splendor of his creation, uh, the horror of the enemy and what he's unleashed on our race, and then Jesus' extraordinary victory over him by his death and resurrection. Look back on all those things, and one of the graces we want to ask for as we seek to respond to the Lord is gratitude. For me, one of the most powerful passages from that to help me just comes from Psalm, Psalm 116, where David simply asks this question. What can I possibly give back to God for all that he has done for me? I invite us just to take a, a couple minutes before the Lord and, and ask him this question. Thinking of C.S. Lewis's quote. So where in your life right now is God calling you and me to be an agent of sabotage? Where is it that he wants to use us, mindful of the authority that he gave us by his spirit living within us to help recreate something, make it more human, more authentic, more in keeping with God's law? Something with, within our daily life, our sphere of influence, could be something in our marriage, something in our family, something at work, in the neighborhood, school, the parish, wherever. How does he, how and where does he want to use us to, to bring life where there's less than life, hope where there's discouragement, light where there's shadows and darkness? I think about it, what's he asking me to blow up right now for his kingdom? Ask him to bring something to mind so that we leave here resolved to do something with all this.